<laughs> um, so I'm going to read a part of the story uh, It's basically about some high school students who are at the Museum of Natural History and it's kind of like a blind date-ish thing. Um, he waited in front of the Tyrannosaurus Rex. It wasn't far from the entrance, so it should be easy enough to find him there. There were swarms of people shedding winter hats and coats, and he heard the buzz of just louder than indoor voices spiked by an occasional kid's scream. He looked up at the T-Rex behind him. It was crouched over, a tack bowed, Jurassic Park style. The bones were the color of clay, the whole skeleton held up with black metal rods. It reminded him of the butterflies they'd studied in school, a blue one pierced through and held up for display. The T-Rex seemed too large in comparison, like its real size was tiny, closer to a quarter, and this was just a blown up model to show the details. But speaking of tiny, he recalled reading that scientists weren't sure what the T-Rex used its disproportionately tiny <laughs> arms for. They could of course still lift about 400 pounds, but they looked ineffectual. The T-Rex may have used them as stabilizers, meat hooks, when it was tearing flesh. The words meat hooks had especially stuck in his brain. He had read that a T-Rex might even go for months without using its arms at all. He stuck his hands in his pockets. What had his arms been doing before that? He looked at the T-Rex claws hanging absurdly in front of its body like a pair of socks draped out to dry. Were his own arms doing that just a second ago? He couldn't remember. He thought of what it must be like not to use one's arms for months. Oh, I forgot I even had you. Oh, arms. <laughs> Did you know that the claws of the T-Rex couldn't even reach its mouth? He imagined trying to feed himself with his handicap, throwing cubes of meat towards his face from the closest point his arms could reach. It would be difficult. Getting the appropriate angle would. A pretty redhead narrowed her eyes suspiciously at him as she walked past. He had been jerking his arms in his pockets, had he? Lying throwing food into his mouth without realizing it, thinking about fucking feeding himself like a T-Rex. Blade me a bit. Blade. Blade? Get it together. What if Ted and the girls he's bringing saw that, huh? Strikes one, two, and three all at once. Ted had met this girl Myra somewhere or other, but when he asked her out, she wanted to bring a friend along because she didn't really know Ted, so Ted said, sure, I've got a friend too. No doubt the friend would be the less pretty one, but really, who was going to complain? As Ted was constantly reminding him, he was no prize bull. What made a prize bull, Blade wasn't sure. Did it mean a savage, grotesque bullfighting bull? Or was it like a prize food bull, real fat and juicy? Did people eat bulls or only cows? Was a bull technically not a cow? Or he supposed was a prize bull, just the one that successfully gave it to the lady cows in terms of calves for cow. Ted suddenly appeared next to him and punched him in the arm. Oh hey, Blade said. Yo, buddy, Ted replied, nodding his chin in Blade's direction. He gestured behind him. This is Myra and Nina. Ted looked at the two girls. One was slightly prettier and it wasn't Myra. Not that Myra wasn't attractive, curly hair, big dark eyes, very white teeth, skin the color of wet sand. But the other girl with her glossy brown ponytail reaching down her back and narrow blue eyes had the smooth features of a face carved out of marble. The curves of her cheeks, her nose, were smooth and sharp at the same time, and the fact that her smile was pained only made her more imposing. She was, after all, above the sponger. Blade smiled. Perhaps he was a prize bull today. Nina was his girl, technically. Ted had asked Myra out, so he couldn't very well switch, and Blade was the only other guy, so it was like he had been assigned, really. He smiled and gave a dumb little wave at them, letting his glance linger on Nina. Oh boy, these are a couple of winners here, Nina thought. Ted had the neck of a steer, and his hair stood in a gel chestnut wave. She wondered momentarily at what about him that appealed to Myra. But it was usually the same thing for all the guys Myra was interested in. Myra was a sucker for guys that paid attention to her. She loved the way they seemed to listen deeply, nodding at all the right moments, giving sympathetic groans when she spoke about her renegade hamster from the third grade, or short barking laughs in response to her confessions of adorable flaws. Myra always liked to quiz them later by dropping questions about previously mentioned anecdotes. Did her hamster's name ring a bell? Why would hearing Thriller get her going? She wanted to know if they had really been focusing, or if the attentive face was like the fog glass of a shower, hiding thoughts of what her naked body must look like and how quickly she could be convinced to reveal it. Sometimes she would even leave an extra button undone as a test, counting the number of times his eyes flicked downwards to her admittedly deep cleavage. In truth, it wasn't really a test. If anything, it intrigued Myra more the higher the numbers ratcheted up. Blade looked less aggressively offensive, 
Not a bad face, fairly straight nose with a small bump at the bridge, eyes the color of caramel. But his two long, shaggy hair made him look like he was wearing a cheap wig, and he held his arms stiffly at his sides, as if he was just getting used to them being there. <laughs> she glanced at Myra, whose wide grin and wide eyes made her look like a sweet doe. Nina wanted to fail immediately. So ladies, Ted said, what kind of animalia should we check out? Lady was still looking at Nina. She looked at Myra. Myra was looking at her map. Hmm, Myra tapped her lips with a finger. Maybe we should start with Ocean Light. I bet there are for sure some seals there, she said. Oh yeah, Ted replied to Myra, casually dropping his glance downwards. Myra raised her right eyebrow at Nina. She could almost hear Myra's voice counting. One. Myra pointed at the hallway to the right, that way, and began to skirt between clusters of people. Ted followed, but Blake could see he wanted to remain equidistant between Myra and Nina, as if his choice hadn't already been restricted by previous circumstances. Blake increased his pace. Nina was obviously his. Looking at Ted, he didn't notice she had stopped moving. His first of speed allowed him to slam directly into her. Nina turned her head at Blake, who had just batted her from behind. He gave her an apologetic smile. She ignored it and whipped her head back around to try to follow Ted. The lobby was like a damn pinball machine. They were ricocheting between bright circles of people, getting jostled back and forth rapidly in certain tight corners. The constant bleeding of a lost cell phone in the crowd made the game feel more urgent, and the erratic flashes of cameras from all parts of the room provided chaos, amplifying the irrational importance of making it through, of winning. But she was almost, almost there, her shoulder slammed into a black-coated man on the right before she spun towards the opening that Ted had left behind him, finally nearing the arch of the Milstein Hall of Ocean Life. She lurched forward, but a woman with a baby on her shoulder appeared suddenly, from nowhere, like a final villain in a video game. Nina halted her momentum and skirted to the side. The woman passed, paused. Nina's face was inches from the small, goggling head of the baby. It coughed, wetly, directly in her face. She had lost this level. She let out a breath and wiped her face with the sleeve of her coat. Even though she had lost, a spacious path suddenly opened up for her to freely move through. Myra and Ted were waiting under the arch, but Blade was just walking up to them from the other side. He seemed unruffled. After slamming into Nina, Blade had felt the familiar feeling, like someone had stuck a straw down his throat and was sucking hard on the other end, his lungs collapsing like a paper bag. <sighs> Hell no, spirit animal. There hadn't been one for a while that he had thought, <laughs> hoped, prayed, threatened that they weren't coming back anymore. Blade merely could get it together, lock it up. But Blade could tell he wasn't driving anymore. It was. He wasn't sure at first exactly what kind of animal it was. It was like darkness sliding around his chest, like too many arms and not enough fingers, the popping sound of pulling up bathtub mats. He could feel the bulbous head inside his brain like a misshapen, overlarge balloon. His feet were redirected. Nina was pinballing in the crowd, her silver scarf disappearing from view. No, no, and no, also no, Blade told himself. Crooning in his ear, a voice like a nautilus shell unwinding itself, an eel with its tail in its mouth, beginnings and endings, the words tying themselves up in a circle. Me, don't fight. It was a whisper. If a whisper could travel deep into Blade's ear, tapping right against, he had just learned, the minuscule bones, the hammer-shaped one first, which would signal, signal the anvil-shaped one to alert the tiny stirrup. Giddy up, Blade said softly, unthinking. He heard the voice respond immediately. Shit, we are trying to avoid that kind of... Blade was still moving, dodging crowds, but forced himself to stop at this remark and glared fiercely at confused passers-by. I'm doing just fine, Blade warned. Back off. I got this flowing like a Ferris wheel. Smooth locomotion. Blade mimicked the circular movement of train wheels with his arms. Metaphors mixed in the public don't do that. Blade glanced around at the crowds and tugged on his coat as he kept moving towards the large block letters that read Milstein Hall of Ocean Line. The darkness began to expand in his chest, seeping coldly into the space behind his lungs, up in his shoulder blades, down into his arms like a bucket head tipped, letting it flow into his fingertips. Ted and Myra were waiting under the archway, but Blade no longer felt able to stop moving towards them. Here, I'll take it from. Nina wished she could just turn back around when she saw the way Ted had his arm around Myra, opening his other arm presumably for her. She gave a short swipe of her hand in greeting and stopped just out of reach. Blade was leaning against a column at the mouth of the entrance, looking kind of attractive. <laughs> she was surprised. His whole body seemed to have slackened, losing some of the awkwardness. 
Before his limbs had seemed decorative rather than functional, like someone had pulled his marionette strings too tightly, his elbows hovering unnaturally, uncomfortably high. <laughs> now the dropped hip, the unconcerned lean, the vertical equivalent of floating on a poolside raft. Oh, come on, she mentally slapped herself. Don't go there. Dud. Dud. Milk dud. Myra jerked a thumb at the entrance. Shall we? She walked in, Ted moving with her, his arm already attached to her shoulders like an encrusted barnacle, eyes falling again, two, at least. Nina glanced at Blade, shrugged off his lean, and gave her an eye roll. She grinned and moved towards the entrance, feeling him following behind her. The room was more dimly lit than the exterior hallway, hazy blue and green light from fogged over skylights, suffusing the space with an underwater feel. The upper level was ringed with smaller displays of the ocean ecosystems. A deep navy carpet covered a set of stairs that led to the lower level, which held at its center a statue of a bronze jellyfish. Larger glass displays were set into the walls, presumably more marine ecologies. A nudge on her shoulder. Blade was pointing up, up, at a towering whale floating near the ceiling. It was slightly folded at the middle, as if preparing to dive. Bifurcated tail, side flippers, gray and white undersides striated with the soft lines of a raked zen garden. Ain't a thing, later marked with a dismissive hand wave, like trying to shake off a fly. Nina's first response was to laugh, but she was confused. What does that mean? What the hell was that, Blade asked. Whales ain't no thing, overgrown dolphins. <laughs> Irrelevant, Blade you. I'm trying to work my game here. He sighed. It was not easy to have a full out argument in silence with a spirit animal. Power animal. Whatever. Your responses aren't jumbled anymore. Weren't jumbled. My swim bladder was caught, flipped. It's different when you come up to the surface. Had to. Blade heard the sounds of wavelets slapping the shore of his mind. It doesn't matter. Let me handle the detaching of your arm in her overduct. <laughs> what? What? Stop having me right now. I'm here to guide you to success in all your endeavors. And there was the sound of wavelets again. Love. Blade felt his feet begin walking forwards toward Nina as she moved down the steps to the lower level. I give you the strength of my water lapping gifts. Uh, right, right, but you just told me to stick my arm in her overdeck? Uh, clearly your gifts do not relate to human courtship, so I'm going to pass, thanks very much. All is translatable, all is displaying. <laughs> He was still carrying himself downstairs for Nina, who was bent over a glowing description of display on the right side of the room. You wouldn't understand. I got this. Wrapped up. Like a present. Like bacon around a sweet fig. Blade mind rolling it up and down again before he was stopped. Overduct, because that's going to get your arm in there. I mean, we'll get you heart love. It should. I'm a prize bowl. Blade glanced around as if Ted would hear him. Not while I'm inside of you. Thank you. <laughs>